Hello again and welcome back to English Today. And this is DVD 22 and the fifth and last DVD of your advanced level and the series. And in this DVD, you will see another two episodes of our story, That's Life, followed by some more special TV programs. This time, our sports expert will be talking about Wimbledon. And then our culinary experts will be talking about wine tasting. Then, in the grammar section, we'll study some more useful phrases for when you're socializing and other ways of expressing probability using likely and unlikely. All right? So enjoy your viewing. I'm so happy you have accepted my invitation. What a strange voice you have. I almost wouldn't have recognized you. It's the thrill. You can't imagine how I've longed for this moment. Oh, really? You don't say. To be truthful, I'm rather emotional myself. Oh, I'm glad you feel that way. Slow down, boy. I really don't want to wake the others. Oh, the others. Never mind. Who cares if they find out? Actually, I'd rather they didn't. You know how I am. I'm shy and reserved. Oh, what a pity. I know. And that's why I'm crazy about you. <laughs> reserved with the others. But you are a tiger when it comes to what you want. Come again? Oh, you know exactly what I'm speaking about. Well, let's light a candle. I want to see your face. You are a little nervous. Come here, baby. Oh, let go of me. Let go. Don't you dare touch me. Oh, you should be ashamed of yourself. <gasps> hey, what's going on in here? <laughs> and what? <laughs> Anne. Oh, now I understand everything. Thanks a lot, Anne. What a great friend no. you are. No. What an idiot I was to confide in you. No, really. Alice, it's not like you think. Oh, and what am I supposed to think then? It seems pretty clear to me. No, no, really. L let me explain. Uh, I thought it would be, I thought it would be Jack. Uh, what does Jack have to do with it? Uh, why did you leave me this note in my napkin the other day? Oh, Edward, it was me who wrote you that note. I can't believe you don't get it. Oh, but the, the poetry and, and the roses, that was you. Sorry about that. I thought... Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, what an amateur you are, Edward. Hey, Anne. Hi. Have you read the paper? There's an article about Peter. Our singer has become famous. No, I haven't read it. To tell you the truth, I'm really not interested. What a pity. It's very interesting. Hey, Alice. Hi, Alice. Take a peek at the paper. There's an article about Peter. Whoopee. Glad to hear it. Who cares? What fun you girls are. It's quite the pleasure to hang out with you. Edward, at least you'll be interested. Would you like to read this article about our friend Peter? Actually, I wouldn't, Jack. Would somebody explain what's going on? I have never seen so many long faces. You and your expert advice. What's eating him? It has he gone star craving mad? No, Jack, I've gone star craving mad. Yet again, I played the fool. 
What an idiot! Okay, Alice, at least you'll explain what's going on. I'm in the dark here. Oh, it's a long story, Jack. A horrible mess. And it all began with a misunderstanding. Well, I'm all ears. Go on, Alice, do tell. Hello again and welcome back. I want to look at some more socialising language with you because very often you just don't learn that when you study in schools and things like that. And it's very important when you're travelling to be able to socialise and feel confident. What I'm going to do is some of the things are new, some of the things you already know. Now, I'm going to say something to you and I want you to think about how we use these particular phrases. All right, so let's start. Now, if I say to you, never mind, don't worry, never mind, don't worry, when do we use that? Yeah, it's often in a situation where, for example, you disturb somebody, you say, oh, I'm terribly sorry, because you pour red wine on their trousers or something like that. I'm terribly sorry. The person apologizes and you say, Never mind, don't worry. It means for you, it's not important. Okay, so never mind, don't worry. What about this one? If I say, what a pity, or oh, what a shame. When do I use that? What a pity, what a shame. Yeah, it's to express your disappointment when something happens. Oh, you can't come tonight. What a pity. What a shame. All right, so disappointment. Good. Next one. This is difficult. This is new for you. If I say just as well, just as well, what does that mean? Eh? You don't know. It's difficult. Just as well has no sense individually. I'll give you an example. It's not going to rain tomorrow, just as well. And in that situation, just as well means I'm happy about that. That's good, all right? So just as well is like saying that's good, all right? Just as well. Great. Next one, sorry about that. Notice we say sorry about that. Okay, that's when you want to apologize about something. Sorry about that. Very common. Sorry about that. Next one, this one. Well, fancy that. Well, fancy that. Now this we use when we want to express surprise. Fancy that. He won the competition. Really? Fancy that. Okay, good. Next one, you must be joking. You must be joking. <laughs> joking, now, that is when you don't believe something. You want to express your disbelief. So, for example, um, England won the World Cup. Oh, come on, you must be joking. <laughs> right? Now, this one you do know, so this is revision. When do we say... Well, actually, I'd rather you didn't. Well, actually, I'd rather you didn't. You know those golden words, well, actually? Yeah. Somebody asks you something like, do you mind if I smoke? And you want to say no politely, not aggressively. So, well, actually, preparation, psychological preparation for no, well, actually, I'd rather, I would rather you didn't. Well, actually, I'd rather you didn't. Very important. These are nice. Mind how you go. Take care. Very nice phrases, those. Mind how you go. Take care. We say 
those mind how you go means be careful when you're traveling. When somebody is leaving you and saying goodbye, we wish them that. Take care, mind how you go. It means look after yourself, all right? And the last one is cheers. Now, cheers is something we usually use when we're drinking to people, cheers. But now we also use it um, in a familiar way to say goodbye, cheers. So that's what I'll say to you now. We've finished our socializing lesson. So cheers, see you in the next lesson. Hi, Anne. Have you got a minute? I, Hi, Jack. I'd like to have a word. You've probably already heard the sordid story. <laughs> yes. Listen, Anne. No, I want you to listen, Jack. You've probably had a good laugh on my behalf. Now, that said, I prefer no further comments on the story. <laughs> it is not my intention to make fun of you, Anne. Although I must admit that the whole misunderstanding was rather amusing. Great. Now, pretty please. Let's not talk about it anymore. Well, I would like to have a word about it. What I'm about to say is, is sure to surprise you. Nothing's bound to surprise me anymore, Jack. Anyway, listen. Don't worry. You don't have to explain. I know how things are. I know that you like me, but just as a friend. A friend that, listen, well, Anne. maybe if we'd met at some other time... Anne, excuse me. Things would have gone differently, and then, well, perhaps... Oh, blah, 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 blah. Anne, can I speak for one minute, please? Yes. Certainly, Jack. Thank you. Go right ahead. Now, you know how... how I suffered about Sharon. And... Well, after her, I... I didn't think I'd ever feel anything about another woman. But then you came back from your holiday and, and I started to feel better. I didn't think about Sharon so much. What are you getting at, Jack? Anne, it was, it was because of you that, that I managed to forget about Sharon. Well, that's what friends are for, n'est-ce pas? <laughs> but you really don't get it, do you? Get what, Jack? Anne, Anne. I'm trying to tell you that I'm in love with you. <laughs> I, I didn't want to believe it at first. I, I thought I was attracted to you because I, I felt so alone in the world. It, but then this feeling grew, and, and when Alice told me about Edward, I, I realized it should have been me to bring you those flowers. Jack, if this is some kind of a joke, it's not very amusing. No, 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 no. It's, it's the truth, I swear. We were made for each other. I should have realized it sooner. I'm sorry. Well, Jack! So, Edward, are you going to explain why you called us all here today? What's so urgent? Well, listen. Something marvelous has happened, to say the least. I must say, I'm a little unsure about what you term marvelous. Oh, let's put aside our differences, Alice. We should all be happy today. Oh, just a moment. Yep. Yeah. Oh, great. Great. Uh, don't worry. Uh, uh, they are certain to accept. I've already spoken with the group. Yeah. They are bound to be here any moment. Yeah. Uh, we'll be sure to get the details later. Bye bye. Edward, do you plan on telling us what's going on? Well, you all remember that I was in touch with the producer to propose what I've filmed with you in this house. Yes, and? He ate it up. He loved you all. The house, your daily gossip, your relationships. Oh, great. They have already arrived. Um, excuse me for a moment. I'll get it. Who's arrived? Who? <laughs> come, come in, come in. This way. Edward, what's going on? 
Hold on, who are these people? Hold on now, Mr. Martin, the producer, has accepted my proposal. We are going to make some TV shows here, and you, you are going to be the stars. You are bound to become famous. And I've already come up with a title. At home with Anne. What do you think? Oh my god. Hello again, and here we are at the last lesson. And if you are still with me, you are so dedicated, I would want to give you a medal. Fantastic. So in this last lesson, I want to say a couple more things about probability and improbability, because it's very important to have and to understand a couple of these words which I don't think you've heard before. So we'll go to the screen to look at these words because they're quite complicated. So probability and improbability. Look at the screen. We can use two words, unlikely and likely. Have you ever heard of those? Unlikely and likely? No, maybe not. Let me show you how they work. I can say to you, if, if, for example, let's take my sister. My sister is a gymnast. She's going in for a competition, but the probability that she will win is low. So to say that in English, I can say she's unlikely to win. Look at that structure. It's the verb to be plus unlikely plus the infinitive. So, if I say to you, my sister is unlikely to win the competition, it means the probability is low. All right, so she's unlikely to win. Now, I can increase that negative probability by saying it's highly unlikely. For example, the weather, let's say the weather. The weather is bad and the chances that it will be improved tomorrow, negative. I say it's highly unlikely to improve. Highly unlikely means it's almost impossible. So we can add highly to unlikely. You see, unusual, unusual structure this. Another example, he's unlikely to get it. All right, so I want you to think about that. Unlikely is something we use a lot in the English language. You need to recognize it and to use it yourselves. Now let's move on to real probability, expressing real probability. Um, in English, we can use the word certain, sure. These are words that you already know. But there's another word which I don't think you know, and it's bound from the verb bind, bound, bound. Now, if I say to you, they're bound to accept, you'll probably think, what? Now, they are bound to accept means they are certain or they are sure to accept. So this is describing real probability. All right, bound to, sure to, certain to. Look at the examples. They're bound to accept it. We are sure to arrive on time. It's certain to work. Now, let's take some examples and put them in sentences. I say to you, China will become a major world power. Now, what do you think about the probability of that? High, yeah? So we could say China is highly likely, this is the positive form, highly likely to become a major world power. Another situation, what about this? In our lifetimes, a woman will become Pope. <laughs> How about that? Mm, right. 
we would say it's highly, un highly unlikely that a woman will become pope, all right? Highly unlikely. Another example, the world's climate will continue to change. I think that's obvious, yeah? So we could say the world's climate is bound to continue, is sure to continue to change if we keep behaving like this. And one more, you'll learn English if you follow this course, that's for sure. So we would say, you're sure, you're bound to learn English if you follow this course. All right, so different ways for you to express probability, strong probability, less strong probability. Fantastic. Well, what can I say to you? You have been wonderful. You've studied hard, followed all the lessons. All I can say is keep practicing. Go to England, go to America, go to Canada, go on a holiday, speak to tourists, speak to friends, do courses, keep reading. It's important, you know English is an important language. Today, it's not possible to work or live without it. So thank you for being such great students. And who knows, maybe you and I will bump into each other in a street in London. Well, I hope so. So take care. Look after yourselves and good luck with your English, okay? Bye and thanks again. The tennis tournament that for many years insisted players were only white. The tournament where the games played on grass and where tradition is a key ingredient. Of course, I'm talking about Wimbledon. Good evening, I'm Eric Brown, and here in the studio with me to tell us more about this famous championship is John Forbes, our sports expert. Welcome, John. Good evening, Eric, and hello, everyone. So, John, can you tell us just why Wimbledon is by far the world's most prestigious tennis tournament? Well, Eric, the world's first international tournament took place at Wimbledon. Today, of course, there are many international tournaments, but Wimbledon has managed to retain a special place in the hearts of tennis fans and most players around the world. And when did the first championship take place? The first tournament took place in 1877, and there were a couple of hundred spectators. Today, nearly half a million people go to watch the tennis, and in addition, millions worldwide follow the games on television, radio and via the internet. For many years, players used to wear white on court. No other colours were allowed. This has changed today, though. And the grass courts? Well, yes, it may be hard to believe, but the games are still played on natural grass. Mm. Obviously, a great deal of care and attention goes into getting the grass to the state of perfection. For example? For example, one tonne of grass seed and three million litres of water a year, and a team of 14 groundsmen. Fourteen? Yes, 14. But you know, Wimbledon's famous grass surface can cause problems. Oh, uh, what sort of problems? Today, very few top-level championships are played on grass. The world's top players just aren't used to playing on grass anymore. And some top players really dislike grass. Oh, were grass courts more common in the past? Yes, they were. Three of the four Grand Slam tournaments used to be played on grass. I guess the one exception was the Roland Garros tournament in Paris. That's always been played on clay, right? That's right, Eric. But the Australian and the US Opens, which were originally played on grass, have now switched to surfaces requiring less maintenance, leaving only Wimbledon with the surface on which tennis originated. And what difference does the surface make? Actually, it makes a big difference, Eric. On grass courts, for example, serves can be very, very fast, over 210 kilometers per hour, and the ball tends to bounce lower than on other surfaces, giving attacking players an advantage. Hmm. And the alternatives? One alternative is the clay surface of the courts of Roland Garros in Paris. Here, Compared with Wimbledon, the game tends to be slower and the ball bounces higher, giving the defensive players the advantage. Fascinating. OK, thank you, John. Uh, oh, one last question. Where exactly is Wimbledon? 
Wimbledon is a pleasant, leafy suburb in southwest London. Obviously, it's famous all around the world for the tennis championships that take place there every summer. OK, thank you again. Thank you. Goodbye. And goodbye to you, and see you again next week for another edition of Sports Special. Today's topic was one of the most important tennis tournaments in the world. A tournament is a sports competition. Did you know the first Wimbledon Tennis Championship took place in 1877? To take place means to happen in a certain location. A championship is like a tournament. There are a series of games and there is a winner, a champion. Today, Wimbledon has nearly half a million spectators. Spectators are people who watch something from a short distance. And millions of viewers follow the championship on TV. Viewers are people who watch something on TV. We can also say to follow something on TV. A person who plays tennis is called a tennis player. Tennis is played on a tennis court. The Wimbledon championships are played on grass courts. Tennis courts with a grass surface. They require a lot of maintenance. Maintenance means care and looking after. The other three famous Grand Slam tournaments are all played on clay courts. A clay court has a fine red earth surface. The first shot in tennis is called a serve. A series of shots between players is called a rally. When the ball hits the ground, we say it bounces. The ball tends to bounce higher on clay courts, and it bounces lower on grass courts. To tend to do something, this means it has a habit of doing something. On grass courts, the game tends to be faster. Wimbledon is a leafy suburb in South London. A suburb is an area of houses away from the city centre, and leafy means there are a lot of trees. That's about it for today. I'll see you on Sports Special next week. Bye-bye. Welcome to all our viewers. Lisa, this is our last show together. I hope you've enjoyed these informal chats as much as I have. Of course. It's been fun for me as well. Now then, what are you going to talk about today? I've received quite a few emails from people who want to learn about wine tasting. You know it's become very trendy these days. Great. I wouldn't mind understanding a little more about wine myself. Let's begin with the right approach to wine. First of all, before drinking it, one should appreciate the taste of wine. There are three steps to correct wine tasting. Look, smell and taste. Well, what should one look for? Colour is the first thing. Whites range from green to yellow to brown and red ones can be pale red to deep brown. Is the colour of wine related to age? The general rule is whites tend to darken with age. It's usually the opposite for red ones. Now tell me, Lisa, why do people tend to swirl their wine before tasting it? For two reasons. To observe the body of the wine and smell its aroma. Now, how do aromas of wines differ? Well, there are many different kinds of bouquet. For example, perfumed, spicy, smoky and toasty. Well, now it's time to taste. Oh, before tasting, how should wines be poured? Let me show you. Still wines, like this one, mm -hmm. should be poured towards the centre of the glass. Mm -hmm. Remember that sparkling wines, on the other hand, should be poured against the side of the glass. Why is that? So the bubbles don't escape. So, now try sloshing the wine yourself. Observe it carefully. Are there good legs? Legs? What do you mean? Can you see the droplets on the glass? Yes. Well, they indicate a thick body of the wine. Now, have a first sip. Swish the wine around your mouth and give us your first impression. It's, how can I say, slightly bitter. Seems like a fruity taste to me. You see, 
you've already identified two wine flavours. Now, take another sip and see if you can't taste the tannin. I'm not really sure. In the beginning, it's difficult to define a wine. Mm -hmm. This is, without a doubt, a round, full-bodied wine. Hmm. Now, I noticed you chose this glass for red wine. What are those glasses for? This glass for red wine is called a Rhine glass. This tulip-shaped glass is for white wines. And that flute is for sparkling wines. And those items over there are the basic wine utensils, aren't they? Yes. This is a corkscrew mm -hmm. and this is a foil cutter. Other useful objects are a drip catcher mm -hmm. and a decanter. Hmm. Well, I'm sure there's a myriad of things that we could say about wine, but unfortunately our time is up. Lisa, thank you for being such a great hostess. My pleasure. Now, let's have a look at the language we used. Lisa said that wine tasting has three steps. When we look at wine, we study its appearance. When we take a whiff of wine, we smell it so as to appreciate the bouquet. This is also called aroma or nose. It can be perfumed, fruity, apple berry-like, for example, bitter, toasty, smoky, spicy, and so on. I asked about swirling. This is moving the glass around quickly to draw in some air. When you slosh wine, the movement is more agitated. Legs are the viscous drops that form and run down the sides of the glass after swirling wine. A body refers to the weight of wine in one's mouth. Wines can be defined round, full-bodied, medium-bodied, or light-bodied. Aftertaste defines the taste that remains in one's mouth, length of time, after swallowing. Tannin is a chemical compound from bark, wood, etc., used in tanning. It mostly refers to red wines. Then Lisa describes the different method in pouring still wines, wines without bubbles or sparkling wines, wines with bubbles. Now, a quick look at wine utensils. A corkscrew is what we use for pulling corks out of bottles. A drip catcher will avoid drops falling on the tablecloth. To let wines breathe, we use a decanter. Thank you very much for your attention. Goodbye.